Hello, welcome to the 39th uh, talk in the No Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. The goal of this seminar is to share example of NOAAs and partners in environmental science by those who lead it and make it happen. Uh, I am Hernan Garcia with NOAA and I'm your MC today. Uh, today's panel will provide insight into NOAA NASA science mission commonalities, benefits, and provide some uh, collaborative areas. Our panel includes uh, Dr. Catherine Calvin as the NASA Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor, and Dr. Sarah Kapnick, which is NOAA's uh, Chief Scientist. I will address you as Dr. Calvin and Dr. Kapnick for simplicity. Uh, and each of you, of course, have a long um, uh, list of accomplishments, which we will not go. So we have a number of questions for you. Uh, let's start with Dr. Calvin and then Dr. Kapnick. Could each of you start off by a briefly by briefly describing your role as chief scientist and what you are most excited about currently? Yeah, thank you, Hernan, and thank you so much for inviting me to do this with you. I'm really excited to do this joint event with my counterpart at NOAA. Um, so my role, you know, I'm in a dual role as you mentioned. So I'm both chief scientist and senior climate advisor. So I'll speak a little bit about both of those. Um, so as chief scientist, my role is really about integrating science across the agency, thinking about strategically how we do science and, and how we communicate that science um, externally. And so I do a lot of communication about our science portfolio. And I think, you know, one thing that's really fun at NASA is science for, for us is, is very, very broad. Um, so it's more than just earth science, but I also represent all of the, the science, including astrophysics, planetary science, um, heliophysics, and all the different aspects um, of science we do at NASA. And within that, I you know, connect people internally, I advise leadership, and I communicate externally. In my capacity as senior climate advisor, um, here I think about climate across the agency, and that includes both our earth science, so the, the, the research we do on understanding and projecting climate change, um, and, and, and observing climate change, but also some of the technology aspects. So we have parts of uh, NASA that do technology development. So our aeronautics team does aviation um, technology development. We have space technology that they do things for us to explore space, but they often have benefits on Earth that are linked to climate. Um, and then, you know, as a, as a agency with centers and facilities across the country, we're also experiencing climate change. And so my job as senior climate advisor is to connect all of that, the science, the technology, the operations, um, and think about that more holistically. You did ask what I'm excited about, and there's a lot of really exciting things going on here. Um, so I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, the, one of the things I'm really excited about, like for me, it's really important, not just that we observe and understand what's happening on our planet, but that we also communicate it broadly and provide information that people can use. And as part of that effort, we opened an Earth Information Center um, about nine months ago. Um, it is, you know, it, NASA is involved, but we brought in all of our other agency partners because there's really important contributions from all the U.S. government agencies to helping us understand what's happening on our planet. Um, and there's a physical space in the NASA um, headquarters building, but also a virtual space at earth.gov. And there's these really great examples of things like NASA and NOAA collaboration where we can show our observations together. And we um, put together some stories that share how our research can help inform um, and what NOAA does with that to communicate it more broadly. So I think it's a really great example. Um, and then I'll just do one non-Earth climate um, example that I'm really excited about. We have a total solar eclipse coming to the continental U.S. Uh, in less than a month. Um, so on April 8th, if you are um, anywhere in the U.S., you'll be able to see some portion of it. But the path of totality, you can look on our website to see where that is. But I'm really excited about that, both just to experience a total solar eclipse, but also we do a lot of science during an eclipse. And so that's very fun. Thank you so much, Dr. Kapnick. Um, thank you. So thank you again, also, Hernan, for putting this on and being our MC today. I, as NOAA's chief scientist, I play a pivotal role in ensuring that NOAA remains at the forefront of scientific research related to oceans, atmosphere, climate, and weather, and that its efforts are effectively leveraged to protect lives, property, and the environment. So from all this, I play a crucial role in shaping the agency's scientific direction and our priorities. Um, so my responsibilities related to that relate to scientific integrity, making sure that our science is trusted, that is produced in a rigorous manner, scientific leadership. Um, as NOAA Chief Scientist, I provide the leadership and guidance to NOAA, reviewing our portfolio, determining where the gaps are, 
and then setting our strategic priorities grounded in rigorous scientific principles, but also in cutting edge research. I've also been tasked with, you know, with the strategic priority setting, developing what our science program needs are for for what the future holds. So I work to identify key research priorities in areas where expertise can contribute most effectively to understanding and addressing pressing environmental challenges. A lot of these are coming up right now around, for example, what is the future of fisheries with climate change and um, setting our research agenda around what do we need to do scientifically to understand predict and project um, fisheries under a changing climate. Others are around uh, climate change and how that affects different types of climate phenomena. What is the information we need to understand it today to be able to forecast or predict it for hours to months in advance? And then what do we need to know about that into the deep future? And what is the entire infrastructure that we need to be able to explore those problems and advance it scientifically? I also have communications um, uh, requirements where I am often a spokesperson for our scientific activities, communicating our research findings and all their implications across the federal government, but also to the public through various channels, including media interviews, public lectures and outreach events. Kate and I have actually often had to do some joint press briefings on key uh, findings and work that we do across NOAA and NASA together. And then also, um, we, I also have requirements around private sector engagement and the science to support commerce. So as the NOAA chief scientist sitting within the Department of Commerce, I coordinate with other with all the other NOAA offices, but also other commerce agencies and many external partners that include both federal agencies, but also state governments, regional governments, academic institutions, international organizations to foster innovation so that NOAA scientific efforts go up and out of our agency for use by our stakeholders and to support the growth in industry. One of our priorities at NOAA is building a climate ready nation. So this has supported various climate mitigation efforts like offshore wind, but also climate adaptation through the use of scientific information to inform resilient investment. Um, this, I think, is a growing challenge as we need climate solutions to deal um, with what we face. And we will see growth um, in the research, but also growth in the private sector to deal with these challenges. So related to that and your question of excitement, I'm really excited about this shift in focus um, towards environmental, towards climate, towards ocean solutions um, to dealing with some of the challenges we see. There is interest at this moment or at a pivotal time where there's a lot of interest of how do we use that science and technology and make it really solutions oriented. Um, and so I'm really excited about the research and technology that we have at NOAA and the products that we're producing. Um, the engagement that we're having um, with both the private sector, but also uh, federal government, cross federal government, but also with communities on how they can take and use that information um, to make make their decisions and to um, build climate resilience, but also to grow the blue economy um, in the marine environment, um, and then to really effectively use that information for their decisions to. Um, make them scientific informed. And so we are at a point where you know, the science has this incredible value. And I feel like we're unlocking the value and continuing to expand its use. Yeah, thank you so much. It's very interesting and informa informative. Um, let's see, uh, Dr. Kapnik, what would you tell your NOAA scientists researchers and leader is the role of NASA in our common field of Earth observation application and climate analysis. And then I will ask the same for Dr. Gali. Uh, so I'll say that both NOAA and NASA play significant roles in Earth observations, um, using satellites and other instruments to gather data on various aspects of the Earth's atmosphere, land, and oceans. And where NASA really leads for all of us is building the cutting edge technologies to be able to create those earth observations, particularly on the satellite missions that are so important in pushing the boundaries of what we can measure and how, and uh, bringing those missions forward that then allow for all the really critical research that we need on um, processes and understanding um, from that scale, but also towards developing, you know, what do we need to monitor and what information will critically drive us forward. Um, and so, 
um, their utilization of this fleets of satellites and instruments um, to observe in this collection of data is so important for advancing the field, but then advancing um, like NOAA's capabilities, we are a user of that data as we figure out our requirements and figure out what goes into our operational uh, weather forecasts and how we advance them. Um, and so that collection is so important and the ability to innovate in that space. Um, and because of it, we, we collaborate closely on a number of things um, from that in um, how we advance the overall field and the downstream use of that information. Great, Dr. Palming. Yeah, so I think, you know, NOAA and NASA have really complementary expertise, and so it's really great partnership and collaboration and working together. Um, I'll kind of think talk about NOAA in two different contexts, one in weather and then one in climate. Um, I mean, with, with weather, NOAA provides the operational weather forecasts and operates our weather satellites. NASA's role in that is really about, you know, helping build and launch those satellites and helping do research. But, you know, NOAA has this operational responsibility, and that's a really important role in people's lives all across the U.S. Um, that's how we get our weather information somewhere behind the scenes. NOAA is doing a lot of work to make sure that happens. Um, and so that's really helpful there. Um, when we turn into climate, you know, it's really climate to me is a multi-agency hold of government effort. So every agency has a role in it. So NASA, NOAA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Department of Energy, USGS, we all play a different part in that because it is such a complex Earth system that's changing and we need to understand that and how it goes forward. When I think about some of the, the big contributions NOAA makes to that, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is really the surface observation. So these long-term records of CO2 concentrations that are important for us in understanding what's happened over the last, you know, 50 to 100 years are coming from NOAA. So you have the CO2 records, you also have these surface weather observations, which show us what's happened over a long time. Um, NASA has satellite records for that, and that can give us spatially explicit information, but we often have shorter records when it comes to that. So when we're looking at this very long term, um, those surface observations are really important. Uh, the other thing I wanted to kind of highlight is modeling. So before I came to NASA, I was working on the Department of Energy's Earth System model. And there are four agencies within the U.S. government that do modeling, including NOAA and NASA, Department of Energy, um, and then NCAR. Um, and those are really important because they each take on a different angle of how they think about the Earth system. And when we use them all together, we can do more together um, and have a more robust understanding of how our planet has changed and how it might change in the future. Um, so there's just a lot of really great work and, you know, we, we depend on NOAA's observations and some of NOAA's information and vice versa. And so it's really great to work together. All right, great. Can I add to that? <laughs> yeah. Adding to what Kate said, um, particularly as we're trying to create this, obs this understanding and snapshots of what's happening in the world, I see all the complementary resources of how we observe, create this you know, quilts across spatial scales, but also um, temporal scales that you put it together to get the full picture. Um, so like, for example, we have, um, you know, our networks of information that we're producing around the US around temperature on the ground. Um, and then in the ocean, we have our gliders that are going deep into the deep ocean. And then you fit that then also filling in all the gaps from the satellite information that is giving us temperature across. And all of that information put together gives us a really full understanding of what's happening with temperature or what's happening with ocean currents. Um, and so when you put all this together, that's how we are able to understand what is happening and then be able to feed it into the modeling of what is going to happen into the future. And so each group has their complementary pieces that they are doing based on their mission, but then the field itself is such a systems problem that it requires, as Kate was saying, with bringing in Dewey and bringing in others, it requires the systems thinking and understanding of how it all works to then create that full picture. And um, I think a really exciting part of working with NASA and from working with Kate um, and knowing her over the years is that we we see where those gaps are. And so we're able to also work together on identifying where do, where do we need to head, but then also how do we collaborate on those key challenges. Um, to be able to ask the scientific questions that we need to ask of all of us, and then how do we all make sure that we move forward towards those problems? Great, thank you. Um, let's dig a little bit more on that question. Um, 
what are specific collaborative projects or initiatives um, are catalyzing new partnerships in your agency? And in more particular, how do they contribute to addressing uh, challenges in scientific research and climate resilience uh, between NOAA and NASA working together? Dr. Galvin? Start? Start? Okay. Yes. Excellent. I mean, we, NASA and NOAA have worked together for a very long time. And I think that, you know, one of the ways is through satellites. Um, as we've mentioned, like NASA builds and launch the satellites that NOAA then operates for weather. NASA has other satellites that are, you know, that are also doing research and observations. But for these weather satellites, you know, NOAA operates that we build and launch. And, and we are continuing that into the future. The next geostationary satellite that NOAA is going to operate, goes you will be launching this spring. So we're really excited about that sort of the next installment in our long-term satellite partnership. Uh, but then there's also the, the research side. So we do a lot of research here at NASA that we can then share and vice versa. And so we had a, a mission that launched a little, almost a year ago called Tropics. This was a set of four CubeSats that NASA launched um, that are looking at hurricanes um, and, and tropical cyclones. And they, they're, they're doing, they're these CubeSats that are focused on sort of more high frequency observations of a, um, a, a hurricane. And so things like temperature and humidity about every hour or so. And by using that, we can better understand how those storms form and evolve. And the goal of research like that is to see how can we help um, operational agencies better forecast hurricanes. And so we involve uh, partners like NOAA from the beginning to see what data that is um, and how it might be used. We also go the other direction. A lot of the NOAA research we use, or observations we use in our own research to improve that. And so it's a really longstanding partnership um, of, of sharing in both directions, information, research, observations. Um, and and as, as we're going forward, I would expect that to continue. Um, and then with some of the other agencies, we, we all engage together on climate. Um, a lot of our efforts, we have a lot of collaborations through things like the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which coordinates on research and is now moving in to some helping coordinate on climate services. So there's a lot of sort of touch points between and um, different agencies um, when it comes to climate. I'm crossing off on my list the thing the joint groups that I wanted to talk about too. So with all of our, we play these synergistic roles in our sciences and we share our advances in innovation and then we collaborate on key research themes to figure out how we can advance on our understanding, our modeling. Um, and we even coordinate on specific missions. Um, so I wanted to, the ones that I'll add to the list are some recent ones that we've done that have had multiple touch points between the two agencies. So the first one I'll mention is AROMA, which stands for the Atmospheric Emissions and Reaction Observed from Megacities to Marine Areas. So this was to assess how air pollution and the natural emissions from the ocean are impacting air quality and climate over North America. And last summer, NOAA scientists used NASA's DC-8, so this massive aircraft, um, which is a, basically a flying laboratory. And we flew it around the country to collect chemical measurements over highly populated cities. So we flew it over New York City, over Chicago, over Los Angeles. And actually on those flights to Chicago, we also were able to cross international boundaries and fly over Toronto. So it was looking over the Great Lakes regions. And this DC-8 mission was part of a really coordinated research campaign um, to be able to, to study this problem. And it included you know, NASA plane and the people flying it, but then it also included scientists from NOAA, from NASA, from 20, 21 universities from three different countries to investigate how air pollution sources have shifted over recent decades. It was the largest air pollution research campaign we've ever conducted in the United States. Um, and it really was trying to get at the problem of two of the most harmful types of air pollution, which are ground level ozone and fine particulates, have decreased only modestly in recent years. But they both contribute, um, we estimate, to about um, 100,000 premature deaths every single year of Americans. And so understanding what causes this, how it changes, how it varies, um, why you have the concentrations in urban environments is really important to be able to reduce that number. Um, so these findings that we have from it have been shared with state and local environmental officials to inform decisions about effective ways to reduce air pollution. Um, and it's also serving as fundamental research um, where we'll have the results coming out in the coming years. Um, this data is 
also came at a critical time to help evaluate the first observations made by NASA's groundbreaking TEMPO mission, um, which Kate, I want to expand upon. But um, it's one of the first geostationary spaceborne sensors to continuously measure air pollution across North America. And so the lessons learned from this campaign, from TEMPO, all of this is going to aid in the development of the new GeoExo satellites um, that we're jointly developing between NOAA and NASA going forward. I also wanted to mention another really cool recent uh, joint campaign that we did, um, the SABRE mission. And the SABRE stands for the Stratospheric Aerosol Processes Budget and Radiative Effects. Um, it was a science campaign to study the transport chemistry and the microphysics and radiative properties of aerosols in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. So we're getting up into the really high parts um, of the atmosphere. And through this mission, we were able to fly over the Arctic at those heights to gather detailed measurements of trace gases and aerosols in an undersampled region of the atmosphere. Um, so this is creating a baseline understanding at that high level of what is going on there. Um, and some of the research coming out of this so far has, has found human influence on stratospheric aerosol particles. Um, and uh, there will be continued research and understanding from this uh, coming out of how how do they get there? What is the expectation of the future in the stratosphere? Um, but also, what is our rate of budget? What is the baseline for that budget? How is that changing? How could that change over time? And so it it really brings together our different infrastructure and tools that we have to measure and quantify um, what is going on in the atmosphere to be able to allow us to figure out how to build our next satellites, how to design future research to answering these questions, and how to build out all the modeling that we need for various timescales. Great, thank you so much. Uh, in the remaining time, I wonder if you uh, have any brief closing remarks. Uh, let's start with Dr. Calvi. Well, um, thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here. And I did just want to echo some of what Sarah just said about the importance of bringing together different types of measurements, different agencies together. So combining that satellite information with the airborne research campaigns. She mentioned Tempo, that's a geostationary satellite looking at air pollution. But we use surface measurements, airborne measurements to help us understand that. And I'm looking forward in the future, you know, we have a lot of more satellite campaigns, you have a lot more programs and projects and missions and, um, and upcoming research. And so there's a lot of opportunities for us in the future to collaborate. So really excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Sure, Dr. Kavnik. And I'll just say it's a, it's a really exciting time in this scientific field. We have so much understanding that's advanced in the last decades on being able to know what observing Earth, but also being able to predict, um, forecast, predict, and project it. Um, but there's a shift um, in particular, too, of making that science more actionable that we're seeing. And we're seeing um, a lot of use-driven science. Um, I've seen, we've always had this as part of our mission, but I'm seeing a gear towards how do we make sure that we innovate and create these spaces of innovation and collaboration, both individually within our agency, but also as we collaborate with NASA and how do we make sure that we're innovating in the spaces that we need and creating the right, um, right environments, creating the right conditions where that scientific innovation is taking place. And a critical part of that is bringing together all the different observation tools that we have, but also the different types of modeling tools and um, subject matter expertise that we have in different agencies. It's not being siloed on this. Um, and I think uh, we've seen a lot of really good collaboration on this type of work. And I'm just really excited about um, the future of development of the technologies that we're doing, particularly from the missions that we mentioned, um, but also the development towards um, how you use this type of information to make informed decisions and how we build out the use and more routine use of this type of climate information, particularly around uh, driving resilience, driving adaptation plans, how we ma manage um, environmental challenges that we have. Um, and I've just think that it's a really exciting time in the science. It's a really exciting time to work at our agencies. Um, and thank you for letting us chat about it today. Thank you so much, Dr. Calvin and Dr. Kapnick. So um, um, we are grateful for your participation today. It's really informative and 
And on a personal note, I, I wish that no one NASA will um, strengthen that relationship moving forward. Um, um, I would like to thank the NOAA Science Council for sponsoring these seminars and the NOAA team who I work with to plan and execute this uh, NAIL seminars. Uh, Kathy Poser, who is the outreach librarian at the NOAA Central Library with NOAA OAR. Sandra Clark, a business analyst with NOAA Nestis OSPO. And Robert Levy, the NOAA Studio Production Manager. I also want to thank uh, Tyler Green and others at NASA for their help uh, putting this seminar together. Thank you so much.